We're joined here on sets. No better man to talk about this than the CFO, Andrew Tam. Andy Tam joins us exclusively. Good morning, and thanks for coming on the show. Good morning. Thank you, David and uh, Yvonne, for having me. Suffice to say you're satisfied with results? Yeah, we, you know, we've been uh, focused on this three-year plan strategy we, we have been uh, embarked on. Mm. Growing our luxury, growing our high-end fashion business, growing also sports business, but at the same time, diversifying our production base across mm. uh, Asia. Uh, and this is the first year of our three-year plan. Mm. And we're ahead of the schedule. Uh, we had a 10% operating margin target and a low teens profit growth, but we actually beat both of them uh, in the first year. And looking at the next two years, our momentum is actually very strong. Uh, with, uh, I would say we have more demand than we actually have capacity uh, for at this point. Hmm. Uh, and your ASP has been rising, yes. um, particularly because you, you are shifting more towards the high-end luxury premium products as well. Is, is this a lasting trend that you're seeing? You know, the thing is, this is absolutely true. Uh, let's move into more luxury, uh, more high-end fashion, like say someone like a Balenciaga or Balmain or a Amiri, which is a really hot brand right now. Uh, the ASP in the product is higher because the quality and complexity is so much harder. And that's actually, they come to us because they think of us as the best footwear maker in Asia on product development and quality. Mm. We're not going to be uh, making a large volume. We're a small batch manufacturing, but more Italian style. And that's why they come to us for that product. And their product just fundamentally has higher ASP because it's more premium. Yeah. Why was revenue down? I, I noticed that it was left out of the... I understand why it was left out in the highlights, but then I look, I turned two pages and then I saw the revenue was down. Just underscore well, the drop in revenue. David. Uh, it's true. Uh, so the, fun thing, the funny thing is that once you move to luxury, hmm. uh, the time it takes to make a luxury product is four to five times the amount we make a regular product. Okay? So like the output actually goes down. So the volume goes down, mm. but then also uh, the revenue goes down as well. Uh, because it doesn't make up for uh, uh, the ASP is not four or five times higher. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in aggregate, it goes down. But also there's a second element. Last year, we do have a sports customer where uh, there's uh, more inventory issues in the channel. Mm. Okay. Uh, but all of that is gone now. So everything's in, I would say, inventory in the channel for our customers right. is pretty healthy at this point. And what markets are doing well? You know, our, we ship to our customer, the global brands. They ship to Europe, U.S., uh, and China, all over Asia. Mm. So they've been really moving around. And obviously, a funny thing is 2023, China was actually up uh, for us, okay? And the funny thing about that is that a lot of our brands actually never were really had direct-to-consumer stores in China. Okay. They were selling mainly directly online. And then when COVID happened, uh, ch uh, Chinese uh, shoppers stopped traveling. They had to find a different path. Uh, basically, opening stores, uh, tailoring a marketing strategy, tailoring a new product. That's China for China. Mm. And that's actually some of what uh, I would say luxury and high-end fashion brands are addressing now and uh, why China actually grew last year for us. Mm. And, and the outlook for China specific this year? You know, it's, uh, in, and, uh, I can't comment on the macro side, but you know, I think right. it, the business, things, the business. things seem weak. For our business, uh, because we have over 40 uh, customers, um, uh, and they all have different strategies in terms of China, but what we hear from them is that they're all really looking at investing in China because okay. they think it's still the largest consumer market, you know, uh, well, not the largest, but second largest, but then it will be uh, probably one of the biggest potentially. Uh, and, you know, there's a, and especially on the high end side, there's still a lot of aspirational shoppers. They will kind of get to that part where they will spend more money on, on the luxury and the high end fashion side. So um, they, what they want to really do now is just really focusing on the right marketing strategy and store and mm. product working with us for the China market. Uh, you also been talking about your three year plan yeah. about where you're really putting your manufacturing facilities, mm -hmm. um, a lot of it which has been in Vietnam, but you're kind of diversifying out to, to more of the Indonesias, the, the Bangladeshis out there. Just walk us through what that strategy is now. You, you know, in terms of production, it's all about diversification. I think we all understand that in Asia, there's a lot of geopolitical risk uh, locally in the, in the economy or across countries. So one of the things we're always trying to do is be preventative. Mm -hmm. And we open factories in uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Philippines, and also, of course, we started in China. We have a, so we can provide our customer that diversified base. So they can come to us and say, they don't have to go to anyone else. Just come to us. We make good product for you, good quality. Uh, and we also, we also don't have to worry about disruption. OK. Uh, if I could, since you're the CFO, let's talk about finances. Sure. Your stock's up. Do you think your stock is undervalued? Like, what's the general sense of 
of, of how the share price is. Yeah. And, and I guess the other question there, since I could, we're talking about it, I'll ask it anyway. Are you, are you planning on giving back money to shareholders in the form of buying back their stock? Okay. So we currently uh, trade around a 9% dividend yield. So we've always committed to a 70% payout ratio for our profit. Mm. So we are definitely the, the returning cash to shareholder. And there's a focus for us. Mm. Uh, now, in the discussion on share buyback, you know, we had discussion with our board. Uh, mm. I think for us, you know, there's different uh, perspective from different shareholders. Some okay. are more tax efficient, obviously, for uh, buyback. Uh, it's different that feedback won't get from all of our shareholders. So it's not just one, but all of it. And then we'll probably decide later on what we want to do. Okay. You, you also have uh, plans to scale down your operations in China um, a, as part of a strategic plan and creating more value for shareholders. Yeah. So well, there, I the, think there's yeah. two things in China. One, uh, we have a manufacturing, which is a large op larger operation versus the retail side. The operation in China is more about uh, we're not scaling down. We're looking at that facility for China for China. Okay. We're actually like, uh, doing more product development for those facilities for product tailored to the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thing is about a retail business. Uh, we have been shutting, shutting down our retail business globally uh, because we have so much, I would say, demand on the manufacturing side for footwear. And we're looking at, in anything else, the next three-year plan is really growing our handbag and accessory ah, side. Okay? Okay. So there's so much focus on that. There's just not enough management time uh, for all of us to uh, deal with the retail brand as well. Yeah. All of you guys need some sleep at some point, <laughs> yeah. right? The executive team as well. So is that, is that, a, is that a trend that continues? Are you per, per, uh, do you see the, eventually the company moving permanently away from retail is, is my question. I, I think there's no plan. I mean, I would look forward, uh, you know, for both uh, Stephen Shi, my CEO, and I, mm -hmm. we're looking at the uh, long-term plan beyond this three-year plan. Next three years, the incremental focus is probably handbag and accessory. Now, beyond that, uh, we haven't had that discussion yet, but probably not in a retail. Okay. Um, there's a lot of consumers and the like that are really gravitating towards sustainability, mm -hmm. eco-friendly sort of products. I mean, is that something that you're very much attuned to here right now in terms of... Oh, absolutely. Sort of so we have some up? customers that we have uh, recycled material soles. Yeah. Okay. So, but that's kind of the DNA of their brands as well. So not all brands have that DNA per se. I'm all recycled material, but some brands are like that. But in general, across all of our you know, luxury and high-end fashion, you know their quality for ESG is very, very high. Mm. So to be able to do business with them, you have to have a very, very high standard. Mm. And that's what we live by. Uh, and then we actually have a dedicated ESG team just to focus on this area to make sure that you know, uh, we, are, we follow all the ESG practices, mm. but also how we get better in this aspect. Right. Uh, any priorities along that front? That's, that, that's an evolving story, right? Yeah. And you have to follow what your customers do. Yeah, Al almost on a weekly basis. Just give us a sense of how that story is in your head, movie. Yeah, I think one of the things is uh, for ESG is like renewables. We want to make sure we have renewable energy. Uh, so we actually install uh, solar panels across all our facilities. Okay, okay. Uh, and there, there are factories that you know I would say countries where we operate in that solar panels not so uh, you know uh, I would say common. Uh, I would say th this is something that we're actually leading the effort mm. to do that. Um, I guess I have to talk about the macro picture, which is inflation, which yeah. still remains elevated in some parts of the world. I'm just wondering, do you still have sort of the pricing power to kind of pass on those, those costs to your consumers and are, right now? And are you now? feeling inflation are cost you, pressures yeah. too coming up? Yeah, you know, for us, you know, uh, when we work with our customer, they come to us for high-end product development and quality. Okay. Their demand and also their end consumer demand is high in quality. So it's not like they're not price sensitive, but they focus more on quality versus pricing pressure. Now, when we look at uh, costing with them, we're completely transparent. How much we pay our workers, and they want to know as well. We want to make sure we treat our workers at a factory level uh, at a very high standard so that they are feel very comfortable with. And also the cost of material. A lot of times the leather, the special material that these luxury didn't have is their material. Okay? So in a way, it's kind of almost a pass-through for them. You talked about brands like Amiri, which is something that, you know, one of your partners in, in all this. I mean, there's, there's this new rise of luxury brands right now. Yep. How do you see this whole competition with some of those traditional yeah. luxury? How yeah. is that going to play out? You know, Amiri is a, a growing brand from uh, L.A. You know, um, they just dressed uh, Travis Kelsey uh, for the Super Bowl. Uh, Did they? Topical. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very, very cool. Very yeah, timely. Like I, can, I cannot pull that suit off, but uh, he can. <laughs> yeah. He's also dating Taylor Swift. I'm not. So very <laughs> different. Hey. Now, uh, with, um, with uh, you know, Amiri, uh, that's one growing customer. But, you know, we have... One uh, over 16 customers over the last uh, three years, and that's the focus. Yeah. Because with brands, you have some taking share with another. You never know which one goes up and down. So it's very important from a business model perspective have a diversified portfolio of customers, and that's what really kind of mitigates a lot of your business risk. Uh, final question: so you mentioned so you had a drop in revenue, 
you mentioned that was because mm -hmm. of this pivot towards luxury. Is that a permanent thing? Is you know, is this pivot to luxury going to cause your revenue to trend lower, or is that a temporary thing? What's your revenue yeah, target yeah. for the year? So you know, when we look at it, uh, it's almost apples orange comparing as we make a transition. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. From what we're currently now versus say what we did four years ago, we're at this point where an inflection point where. Uh, we kind of the mix where we have a luxury and fashion is pretty more stable, close to what we target. Uh, so I think going forward, next couple of years, we'll probably see revenue grow uh, and also profit are, are growing along with it as well. Mm. Uh, but more, more importantly, our target is net profit after tax, you know, uh, low teens CAGR for the remaining of three-year plan. We're ahead of the ball game, and we feel like the, mall, the, ball, uh, the momentum is pretty strong for our business uh, to continue that. Okay. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We didn't get a zoom in on your shoes, and I didn't get to ask you what you're wearing. <laughs> uh, wearing Mary today. Ah, there we go. There you go, Travis Kelsey. Okay. Um, okay. There we go. A little bit <laughs> on your screens. Here's mine. Come on, come on. A little bit. Go. There, okay. I <laughs> wish I could wear sneakers. Yeah. There, yeah. <laughs> Andy Tam, CFO, Stella International Holdings.